Welcome to the first Sunday of 2015. Today we're in chapter 15 of the story, and for the next few weeks, our theme will be God is speaking. Are you listening? You know, God spoke to his people back in the Old Testament, and he still speaks to us today through the prophets. They're also known as God's messengers. As we begin this new year, we're about halfway through the story. And if you're new to Kimball Christian Church or Kimball Church of Christ, I would encourage you to pick up a copy at the Welcome Center and, and begin reading with us. And if you've fallen behind in your reading, it's a great time to uh, make a New Year's resolution and, and get back into reading the story. As we continue in the story today, we find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Every story has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And life is like that, isn't it? We have life cycles with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. <clears throat> we have new beginnings in life, and they bring us excitement and joy. The Arnolds and the Krippners had excitement and joy with the recent births of Edward Arnold and Lorelei Krippner. Their parents, and especially their grandparents, their family and their friends, they all eagerly anticipated that new birth. They were excited about what the future would bring. We all like new beginnings. Things are fresh. Things are new. We have a sense of purpose and, and hope, just like today, at the beginning of a new year. 2015. But we also like endings, don't we? The end brings resolution. It brings an end to all the striving. You, you cross a finish line. You look back. You can see things from a new perspective. It's fulfilling. Whether it's graduation or retirement, you can see better sometimes from the end, looking back. Because you've learned something along the way and and so we like endings, but we're in the middle today. So much of our life is spent in the middle. It feels like everything is just a mess. Sometimes from the middle, it seems like the beginning is so far away and you're not sure where you even started or how you got to where you are today. Sometimes in the middle, it's, it's difficult to know how things are going to turn out and, and where things are heading in the future. It's hard to be confident that you'll end up where you hoped you would be when you started out. So we're in the middle today of the story. And it's a mess. Life brings you moments like that sometimes. And in the story, the, the people of Israel have arrived at a place in the middle. And their life is a mess. What has developed up to this point and what God has been doing in the story, all of a sudden seems to be in jeopardy of coming unraveling. Life is a mess for the chosen people of God. It's described for us in by the prophet Elijah. Listen to his words in 2 Kings chapter 19. Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. You see, life is a mess for the chosen people of God. Elijah is telling God that the people that he has chosen, that he is going to use to bless all the nations of the world, well, they've rejected him now. They've torn down all the places that have been set aside to worship God. The prophets who are charged to represent God and speak for God, they've killed all the prophets. Except for me, Elijah says, I'm the only one left, but I'm on their hit list. It's not a very good time in the history of Israel. Things are not going well, especially for Elijah. And as we read through the story, we can see it. 
kind of catches us by surprise. This is not where we would, thought we would be when we started, especially not after what we've read through the last few weeks. God has given them the king that they so desperately wanted so that they could be like all their other neighbors. David, the warrior poet, is a national hero. He stabilizes the kingdom doing, during what is known as the golden era of Israel. And David then successfully paces, passes the baton of leadership on to his son Solomon. Solomon extends the borders of the kingdom even farther than David had. It's a time of peace and prosperity. Solomon is the greatest king in all the world. And people come from all over the world to listen to his wisdom as he speaks. And it seems like the goal that God started out with back in Genesis chapter 12 to, to bless all the nations of the world through Abraham and through his seed, it seems like it has finally come to that point where it can be fulfilled because the kingdom of Israel is now at the height of all of its glory. But now we read that things are falling apart. As we let, read last week, the kingdom is now divided. There's civil war going on. Rebellions against the incumbent kings are commonplace. One idiot king follows another. I won't mention anything about our government at this point. The people that God handpicked have rejected him. What's more is that they are killing all the prophets who speak for God. How quickly things can change. You've observed the same thing in your life, haven't you? It can change quickly. If you don't stay on top of things, if you're not paying attention, all of a sudden, things become a mess. What once was working now isn't. What once was good now isn't. You look around and you think, well, wait a minute. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. How did we get here? What happened? How quickly? Things can change. Like when you're at home with young children and you leave them in a room by themselves for just a moment. You leave and you come back and what happened? It wasn't like this when I left. How did this happen? Things can change quickly. Or sometimes you're left asking yourself that question about more serious matters in life. You go off to college. It's a new beginning. It's a new opportunity. Finally, you have the freedom that you've wanted for, for so long. And, but unfortunately, you're not very grounded in your faith. You fail a couple of classes. You make some bad decisions, some bad choices. You're struggling with life and, and things become a mess. Like we said last week, there are consequences for your choices, how quickly things can change. Sometimes life can leave you wondering, what happened? Why did it change? How did we get ourselves in this mess? Why is a gifted prophet and a leader of God's people running for his life? And everybody's trying to cover it up, they ignore it. They're blind to a problem. God's people are not ready to admit that there's anything wrong. They just go on with life. That's why God has to send them a messenger. God's messengers is what this chapter is called, and it's a, it's a good description of the prophets. They are God's messengers to the people. They speak for God. And He needs to communicate with His people in order to shine some light on their situation. He seeks to share with them his perspective on life. And as good as that sounds to us today, I'll bet you understand why a prophet and his message is not always welcome. The prophets bring a critique. When everybody else is saying it's fine, everybody's doing it, the, the prophet says, no, that's wrong. That's out of whack. It needs to be corrected. The prophets speak truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. The prophets announce judgment. 
There's sin, and the sin needs to be dealt with. There's consequences. No one likes to hear that. And the prophets also reveal God to us. At a time when God has been forgotten, when people have turned their backs on God, they've distorted the image of God, God sends a prophet. The prophet speaks for God. Remember me? I'm sure you understand why nobody wants a prophet around. When we've decided on how we're going to live our lives, no one likes a messenger from God to come and tell us that we're doing it wrong. That's exactly how Ahab felt. Ahab was the king of Israel at this time. We're introduced to him in chapter 15 of the story. He's also described for us in 1 Kings chapter 16. Watch as I read. <clears throat> Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of a foreign king. He began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, another goddess, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. How would you like that on your tombstone? So who is this King Ahab? You can begin to see why things are going so wrong in Israel at this point. They violate one of the big ten. They get sucked into worshiping other gods. They break God's commandment forbidding idolatry. Ahab is the king of Israel, but he lacks any allegiance to the God of Israel. And when God can't rely on the king to lead his people, he calls for his prophets to step up and to speak for him. Enter Elijah, the prophet. Not a real close friend with King Ahab. In chapter 15, we read about this epic showdown that occurs on Mount Carmel. It's a fantastic story. In fact, one of my favorites from the Old Testament. King Ahab and Elijah, they're rivals. Elijah can't stomach Ahab's pagan idol worship. And so he challenges Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 18. He says, gather everyone from all over Israel and meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal while you're at it. Bring the 400 prophets of the fertility god Asherah as well. This is big. I mean, it's, this is pay-per-view kind of stuff. They gather on Mount Carmel. Elijah addresses everyone. How long? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, well then you can follow him. And Elijah proposes a way to discover who the real God is and who is the imposter. Two altars are built. One for the Lord and the other one for Baal. A bowl is placed on each altar, and whichever God answers by sending fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice, he is the one true God. The Baal prophets, well, they go first. They place their bowl on the altar, and they begin petitioning to Baal to answer them. They, they shout and they pray from morning till noon. Nothing happens. Elijah, I like Elijah, he starts talking trash to them. Shout louder! He must be sleeping. Maybe you need to wake him up. Maybe he's just too busy. He doesn't hear you. Maybe he's gone traveling somewhere. Shout louder. Pray harder. The prophets of Baal, they cut themselves with knives. They work themselves into a frenzy. But there's no response and their gods do not answer. And then Elijah steps up and he prepares the bull on his altar. He says, pour four big jars of water over the bowl. And so they do. Do it again. And they do. Now do it a third time, and they do. They pour 12 jars of water over the altar, and it's now soaking everything. It falls down into the trench that Elijah had dug around the altar. And next, Elijah prays to the Lord, the God of Israel. He prays, Lord, let it be known that you are God. 
Answer me today that these people might see who the real God is. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, burns up the bull, the wood, the stones, the dust, even licked up the water in the ditch. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they cried out, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! And then Elijah commands them to kill all the false prophets of Baal. They were imposters. It's an amazing moment in the history of Israel. You would think that it would turn the tide of God's people. Unfortunately, not much changes. Not even the most public, most awesome display of God's power is able to curb the idolatry of these people. Now, when we look back on this miracle, they, there's a couple of natural responses. I think one of them is to say, those idiots. How could anyone witness what God did and, and not follow him? We wouldn't do that, would we? Surely, if we had been there, if we'd been able to see what they saw, we'd be sold out for God, wouldn't we? A second response to this story, something along the lines of, well, that's kind of weird. Sacrificing bulls, dancing around, cutting yourself, all those pagan worship practices, I mean, that's so Old Testament stuff. So far removed from our civilized world today. That idolatry is such a thing of the past, isn't it? Might I suggest to you this morning that either of those two conclusions would make us just as blind as the people that Elijah is having so much trouble getting through to. You do need to thoughtfully consider this morning, are they really that much different than us? Is their situation really that irrelevant? to ours today. Yes, I know they're, they're simpletons. We know so much more about the world than they did. Plus we have access to the whole story, front to back, not just the middle here. We have the perspective of history that we can see through the lens of an empty tomb. We too have witnessed a, an epic showdown where God proved himself as a victorious Jesus who was God in the flesh comes back to life and he makes promises to us. He says, sell out for me. And yet, how many times do we let things get in our way and we're not sold out for God? Are we really that much different than they were? We will probably never see an altar of Baal being set up here in central Minnesota. We won't be caught shouting and slashing our wrists in hopes that the Baal will give us what we want. You see, our, our idol worship is much more civilized than that. Instead, we will consume. We will accumulate lots of stuff and consumerism will be our God. We'll trust in the stuff that we've collected to give us meaning and purpose in life. Or we will control. We'll control everyone and everything around us. We will always make sure that things work out for our benefit. Perhaps we will indulge. Pleasure will be our God. And in the name of that God, we will dishonor ourselves and others. We will forfeit true joy for the momentary thrill. Maybe significance will be our God. We'll pursue prominence as if our worth depended upon it. We won't rest until we're noticed. We won't stop until we're at the top. Security, that'll be our God. We will make life predictable and comfortable for us. The creator God, he's far too dangerous. He asks too much of us. And if none of those satisfy, religion will be our God. Our trust will be in our own righteousness. Religion will allow us to be better than all the other people. We'll segregate ourselves from anyone who is not as good as we are or doesn't look like us. 
our days will be consumed with comparing ourselves to others. And when we talk, it'll always be about how good we are. The righteousness that we have earned on our own will be our reward rather than the righteousness that is given to us by the Savior of the world. We'll gather around the altar of religion and expect our religion to save us. But it won't. Neither will any of the rest of them. That's the real issue that we're facing here today. It's not just that idolatry is bad and you shouldn't worship idols. It's that you're being duped. You're missing out on what God has in store for you. The God of the story wants you to know that He loves you. He's made promises to you. He has a purpose for your life. He wants to give you the good life. Abundant life here and now. Eternal life in heaven. Idolatry is not an ancient problem. Idols are not a thing of the past. Like people, they're still hanging around. They just dress differently. Their ability to lead us astray is as strong as it ever was. So we need a prophet. We need to hear from the voice of God. Which God are you listening to this morning? Which God have you allowed to sway you with its promises? In spite of the promises, idolatry will always make a mess out of life. Idols always overpromise and they underdeliver. They say they will fulfill us, but they don't. They always leave you empty. They promise to keep you safe, but you, your anxiety only increases. You think you're being set free only to be enslaved. When your relationship with God is distorted, it makes a mess out of your life. There's another prophet in this chapter who tells us about what's going on in the life of Israel. To give us a clear picture of what's happening, God sends another prophet with a message to Israel. His name is Amos. He's introduced to us as a shepherd from Tekoya. So typical of God to use a regular guy for a special purpose. We've seen it throughout the story. Amos is not a professional priest or a professional prophet. Amos is just a layman, but he has a message from God. He's a humble shepherd from the Judean hillside, minding his own business, providing for his family, worshiping his God. He's no Billy Graham, but he's just what God is looking for when he needs his needs to address his people. And so God sends Amos with a message for Israel, the northern kingdom. You remember that the kingdom is now divided. There's Israel in the north. There's Judea in the south. Elijah, Elisha had their careers as prophets to the people of Israel in the north. And now God is sending Amos to speak to them. God sends with him a message that begins with a type of prophecy that Sometimes we can tolerate its judgment on other people. Don't we always like it when the spotlight is not on us, but it's on someone else? And so Amos just starts telling it like it is. He's never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He just starts pronouncing judgment on everyone and everywhere. Damascus, Tyre, Gaza, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah. They're all messed up. They're guilty of idolatry. Crimes against humanity, oppression, slavery, killing women and babies. It's about time they got what they deserve and everyone's nodding in approval. Amos is barely getting started. Because look at what he does next. He holds up a mirror to the people. And he says, now what they did is bad. I'm talking to you now. You've got a mess on your hands, Israel. And here's why. Amos 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord says. The people of Israel have sinned again and again. I will not let them go unpunished. They sell honorable people for silver and poor people for a pair of sandals. They trample helpless people in the dust and shove the oppressed out of the way. Both father and son sleep with the same woman. 
corrupting my holy name. You thought everyone else around you had issues? Listen to what God says. Chapter 3. So listen to this message that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the entire family that I rescued out of Egypt. From among all the families of the earth, I have been intimate with you alone. And that is why I must punish you for all of your sin. God's saying here, I picked you. Do you remember that? I made you who you are today. That's why this is such a big deal to me. I rescued you from the oppression that you were in in Egypt. Have you forgotten that you were slaves down there? You were being treated unjustly. And then you cried out to me to save you, and I did. But now look what's going on with you. My people have forgotten to do what is right, says the Lord. Their fortresses are, my, are filled with wealth and taken by theft and violence. Therefore, says the sovereign Lord, an enemy is coming. He will surround them and shatter their defenses. Then he will plunder all their fortresses. He's going to use another nation to come and bring judgment on Israel on his chosen people. Amos continues with some examples of how far Israel has fallen. How you hate honest judges. How you despise people who tell you the truth. You trample on the poor, stealing their grain through taxes, unfair rent. Therefore, though you build beautiful stone houses, you will never live in them. Though you plant lush vineyards, you will never drink wine from them. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Here's the judgment that God announces on Israel through his messenger, Amos. O oh, people of Israel, I'm about to bring an enemy nation against you, says the Lord, the God of heaven's armies. They will oppress you throughout the land. From Labo Hamath in the north to the Arabah Valley in the south. In other words, you're going to get a taste of your own medicine. You will reap what you have sown. Israel is forced to reckon with another issue that is distorting what God intended for them. They must also face the injustice that is running rampant. Their relationships, brother to brother, sister to sister, man to woman, they're all out of whack. They need to be corrected. It's going to be hard to convince these people, though. You see, they're living at the top of the heap now. They're comfortable with the way things are. Lush gardens, fortified palaces, beds with ivory, feasting and drinking going on. It's an affluent society. Not so much different than our own but it has come at the expense of the poor. They are at the bottom of the social ladder. They are invisible to those who are on the top. And yet they are not invisible to God. It's a fact that you cannot miss as you read through the Bible, especially as you read through the prophets. Even though our tendency might be to dismiss those who are poor or weak or different, God, over and over again in the scriptures, affirm their value to him. Scripture describes God as one who fights for the cause of the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, who sets the prisoners free. He sustains the orphans and the widows. With righteousness, he judges the needy and extends justice to the poor on the earth. Likewise, his scripture commands his people, commands us to seek justice, to encourage the oppressed, to plead for the widow, to share our food with the hungry, to provide hospitality to those in need. Israel is not doing that. We need to examine ourselves. Are we doing it? Worse, they pretend that nothing is wrong. They go on with their religious festivals. They sing their songs of praise. They go through their religious motions. And God is not okay with that. That is not what it means to represent me in the world, he says. I hate all your show and pretense. 
the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your hymns of praise. I will not listen to your music, no matter how lovely it is. It's quite an indictment against Israel. Here's what you can do. It's something that's been missing for a long time now. I've said it to my people over and over again, and interestingly, it's, it's the same message that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once quoted from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. But let justice roll on like a river, like a never-failing stream. Doesn't it seem fitting that we're listening to God's ancient prophets at the time of the year when we remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Just a couple of weeks. He was convinced, just like the prophets of old were convinced, that when we distort our relationships with other people, it makes a mess out of life. He was stuck in the middle of it. He saw how ugly it was. And against the tide of injustice that threatened to overtake him, he did everything that he could to put an end to it. What about you and what about me today? Most of us live in relative comfort. We have material blessings. But with those blessings comes a sense of responsibility to others. What do you see that is wrong in our world today? What is God calling you to help set right? Is it human trafficking? Racism? Malnutrition? Any number of issues where maybe God is calling you to get involved. Stephen W. Capes saw a need in the Dominican Republic. They just returned from their umpteenth trip down there to make an eternal difference in the lives of those children and their families. What do you see where you can get involved to make an eternal difference in the lives of others? And God's message to us is pretty simple and clear today. We need to stop living lives of idolatry and injustice. Our relationship with God our relationship with other people is what life is all about. And we need to get those relationships right. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. We need to get those relationships in life right. That's what it boiled down to for Jesus. Love God. Love your neighbor. Serve. Coming to grips with the prophetic message can be a lot to process. Especially if our lives are out of line. The prophets critique us. They speak truth to us. Sometimes it can hurt. But the prophet Amos also gives his people some simple direction for how they can best respond to his message. He says in Amos 5 verse 4, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. I think that's what the Lord is saying to us today. Seek me and live. You hear Jesus saying that to you today? Think about that as we approach the communion time together this morning. For it's here where Jesus invites us to seek him and find life. It's where he proclaims that there is life in me. There's forgiveness here. No matter how messy your life is, if you seek him, you will live. There's forgiveness and mercy and grace at the foot of the cross. Seek God and listen to him this morning as we pass the bread and, and the cup. Those who are serving can come forward at this time. And I want to encourage you as, you as you meet God today, in the next few moments as we pass the emblems, 
Seek the one who gave up his body and shed his blood on Calvary for us. He died that we might live. So seek him and live today as we partake in the communion time. Let's pray.